Knight says he's concerned that he, Commissioner Frank Bray, and Commissioner Joel Barfoot weren't given advance notice of last Tuesday's meeting, and he asked County Administrator Dave Stockman for an explanation. Stockman says he left messages for Knight and Bray. He says Barfoot got in contact with him 30 minutes before the meeting and was told at that time. But Knight says the commission should change its call meeting procedure to accommodate the commission members. It would seem that you would get a consensus from the commission for the convenience of the commission as to when we hold a meeting rather than the convenience of some of these financial consultants. They're trying to make money off the county and, uh, and, and uh, I don't understand how. It seemed like we got the whole process just a little backwards here where we schedule the meeting whether they could be here regardless to whether the commissioners could be here or not. The commission then decided to call another meeting with the financial representatives to discuss their suggestions on financing the new jail. That meeting will be held on Monday, February 1st at 1.30. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA, TV News. Siegelman says it's difficult to determine the number of persons who have died, moved, or who have been classified as felons, and consequently, many unqualified voters remain on lists undetected. However, he says the Montgomery County Registrar's Office has done an outstanding job on updating voting lists. Montgomery County has, has taken the lead in this area and has uh, sought out these people and have managed over the last three years to purge some 5,700 people from the voter registration list. What Siegelman says a systematic is, method of identification systematic needs to be incorporated in each county in an effort to remove the names of those deceased and those who are no longer qualified to vote. Siegelman is optimistic that pending legislation will mandate statewide computerization, which will help registrars keep the voting lists updated and at the same time save thousands of taxpayers' dollars. In addition, and just as important, according to Siegelman, is the prevention of voter fraud, which has been a big problem in recent elections. Dan Black, WSFA TV News. Down power lines, broken tree limbs, icy roads, and broken water pipes. All part of the worst winter storm to hit Alabama in 25 years. State Civil Defense Director Sam Sloan says preliminary figures indicate the storm did $58 million in damage to the state. He says 46 counties, mostly in the northern two-thirds of the state, are included in the request to Washington. But Sloan says it's a coin toss if the state actually gets federal disaster assistance. Uh, we've had some precedent set in 1973 when we had an ice storm in the, in the southern part of the state and requested uh, federal disaster assistance. This was denied. Uh, we had a similar situation in the uh, early 1960s where we had a tremendous amount of uh, storm damage from uh, snow and ice and we were denied in that particular situation. However, we're dealing with uh, a different administration, uh, different uh, federal regulations, uh, and an entirely different uh, set of circumstances. State civil defense employees will be working with federal officials to confirm damage figures in the state, which are still unverified. It should take the feds about two or three days to inspect the damage, and within a week, the state should be notified if it's eligible for disaster assistance. Don Phelps, WSFA TV News. This is Alatex Troy, the older of the two plants, which began operations in 1946. But now, after 36 years, it and its sister plant, Alatex Pike, which opened in 1958, are closing their doors. 
plant manager Don Sasser blames hard economic times and foreign imports. Well, it's due to increased competition from import shirts, and uh, this is the main thing we found that we can produce the same amount a dozen in one location. Sasser says of the 450 workers to be laid off, 150 will likely be transferred to another plant in Enterprise some 37 miles away. But that still leaves 300 people jobless. Many of these people have worked here all their lives, and textile work is the only thing they know. And now that the plants are closing, they're worried about what they'll do to support their families. Ruby Powell and Margaret Oliver have been with Alatex nearly three decades. Well, well, I'm just going to wait a few weeks and see what they offer us, and if they don't offer us anything to transfer, I'm going to be looking for a job. Are you optimistic about being transferred or maybe finding another job? Yes. Uh, optimistic about being transferred. I don't know about another job because there'll be over 400 people without jobs. And we all just so upset about it, you know. Wondering what we're going to do, our kids and everything, you know. It was a uh, shock uh, to us because we've been working here so long and uh, this is just about all I know how to do. So after 18 years, uh, you don't really know how to take it. Many of the other Alatex workers are too young to retire and are too old to start a new career. Those workers who have been employed 10 years or more will receive a pension from Alatex, but not until they reach age 62. Workers employed less than 10 years won't receive anything except unemployment compensation, which for most would only be half of their weekly salaries. The plant closings will also have a drastic impact on the local economy. It will lose an annual payroll of three and a half million dollars from the two plants. Plant manager Don Sasser says it'll be a few months before the plants are completely closed down. However, layoffs are scheduled to begin sometime next month. From Troy, Dan Black, WSFA TV News. The Senate was about to adopt a special order calendar listing the bills to be considered today. Under the Senate's interpretation, Senate Rules Committee Chairman Albert McDonald offered a single resolution exempting the list of 10 bills from the budget isolation measure. That prompted Senators Ted Little, Bishop Barron, Dewey White, and others to protest, saying they felt budget isolation called for a resolution for each bill, not one resolution for all of the bills. Lieutenant Governor McMillan called the Rules Committee members into his office where they decided the other senators were correct. Back in the Senate chamber, the members agreed to the list of 10 bills and then considered a resolution exempting the first of those bills. That bill belonged to Rules Chairman McDonald. The resolution exempting McDonald's bill from isolation passed, but the Senate adjourned before any debate on the bill itself was offered. McDonald's bill would create an independent commission to handle nursing home reimbursements from Medicaid. Very little was accomplished in the House. An afternoon start combined with an informal speech from a mental patient and an appearance by a South Korean high school singing group consumed most of their time. The time was used by most of the members to align support for their individual bills. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News at the Capitol. They're sending teams to the state to go to the various counties and uh, try to verify the damage reports that we have to determine uh, if our request does warrant a recommendation to the president for a disaster declaration for these counties. Now, at this point, of course, we don't have any idea what their uh, receptiveness will be as far as the declaration is concerned. Uh, that'll come out of the uh, actual inspections that they perform. This is Alatex Troy, the older of the two plants, which began operations in 1946. But now, after 36 years, it and its sister plant, Alatex Pike, which opened in 1958, are closing their doors. Plant manager Don Sasser blames hard economic times and foreign imports. Well, it's due to increased competition from import shirts. And uh, this is the main thing we found that we can produce the same amount of dozen in one location. Sasser says of the 450 workers to be laid off, 150 will likely be transferred to another plant in Enterprise some 37 miles away. 
but that still leaves 300 people jobless. Many of the other Alatex workers are too young to retire and are too old to start a new career. Those workers who have been employed 10 years or more will receive a pension from Alatex, but not until they reach age 62. Workers employed less than 10 years won't receive anything except unemployment compensation, which for most would only be half of their weekly salaries. The plant closings will also have a drastic impact on the local economy. It will lose an annual payroll of three and a half million dollars from the two plants. Plant manager Don Sasser says it'll be a few months before the plants are completely closed down. However, layoffs are scheduled to begin sometime next month. From Troy, Dan Black, WSFA TV News. Collecting rates under bond allows us, uh, is, is really part of the due process that uh, is guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution. The idea of taking away the ability to collect rates under bond is politically motivated because it keeps the utility from being able to collect while an appeal is being heard before the Supreme Court. And that's obviously designed to be popular with the voters and the ratepayers. But it hurts the utility, and it ultimately hurts the customer. When contacted by telephone, Alabama Gas Corporation official Jim Alderman says no change in the present law is necessary. Company spokesmen also say collecting rates under bond protects not only the company, but its customers, property, and level of service. When company rates are appealed to the Alabama Supreme Court, the justices have four options to grant some, all, or none of the requested rates under bond, or remand the case to the PSC with specific instructions if the rates are collected under bond, and should the High Court determine, after finally hearing the case on its merits, that no increase is warranted, the utility must issue refunds with interest to its customers. The appeals process can take from a few weeks to several months. Utility company spokesmen say they intend to lobby against House Bill 4 and any piece of legislation designed to keep them from collecting rates under bond. Kim Davis, WSFA TV News. Montgomery County Commissioner John Knight says the majority of the commissioners are concerned that not all of them are being informed of meetings and other actions that take place in the county. During last night's commission meeting, Commissioners Frank Bray, Joel Barfoot, and Knight voted to hold a review session on Stockman's job performance. But before the closed-door session, Knight asked Stockman to explain why three commissioners weren't notified in advance of a meeting with several financial institutions to discuss funding for the new county jail. Then afterwards, the commission voted to reschedule the meeting in question for February 1st. Knight says this isn't the first time the three new commissioners haven't been informed of commission action or a scheduled meeting. There seemed to be or seemed to have been in the last few months an effort or 
to inform certain commissioners and not inform the entire commission. And we operate as a body. We don't operate individually. And the only thing that we are asking at this time is that any decision that's going to be made, any meetings that's going to be called, that all of the commissioners be contacted concerning these meetings, along with a number of other concerns that we have as it relates to the Montgomery County Courthouse. Commissioner Joel Barfoot agrees with Knight's statement. Barfoot says he questioned Stockman's credibility. He says he doesn't believe the whole truth was told. Barfoot says there have been several instances where the three new commissioners have been ignored. The entire commission will discuss the matter in greater detail Thursday morning at 9 o'clock. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA TV News. Catch a runaway horse and tie up a burglar with eight inches of cord. In the 1960s, the Beatles were big, and under 30 and over 30 became more than just numerical differences. The generation gap was... I think Alabama's probably playing the best basketball in our league. Now, Alabama plays above the basket with six, six hands on almost every play. They're getting great guard play from uh, Ennis Watley, uh, and they are playing so well at home. And they're substituting so much and not losing anything. Right now, right now, I'd have to pick them as the best team in our league. And there's some very good teams. We beat a good team today. That's a very good basketball team. And, and we got another one coming up just as good or better. There are just a few new rules for filing your 1981 federal income taxes. Most of the changes are still to come. One beneficial change for taxpayers this year is a reduction in rates. Basically, there's a 5% reduction in tax rate in 1981. And because the change took place in October, it's an effective 1.25% change. The maximum rate will be reduced from 70% down to 50% for the maximum rate and for the, the lower level rates will be reduced from 14% uh, to 11%. Another change is in the sale of a personal residence. A person 55 years of age or older in 1981 can exclude the first uh, $125,000 of gain on the sale of a personal residence. This is a once-in-a-lifetime exclusion, and they don't have to reinvest the proceeds. Um, another area relating to the sale of the personal residence is that previously there was a 18-month uh, deferral period for deferring the gain and not having to reinvest in the personal residence. And now that has changed to 24 months. Borden says there are very few changes in the types or amounts of deductions taxpayers can claim this year. He says most of the changes are in the income exclusion area. Gina Gregory, WSFA TV News. One way to decide which form to use is to figure up just how many deductions you have, such as medical, dental, and interest paid on mortgages or credit cards. If you're single and can come up with more than $2,300 worth, it might be worth your while to use the 1040 form and list deductions on Schedule A, itemized deductions. If you're married, the maximum amount is $3,400. Uh, there is a, a maximum amount that they would have to have in order to itemize a deduction. Uh, we find that more and more people now, because of the, the increase in this amount, are using the tax tables or are uh, filing the short form return, the 1040A. It, it eliminates the requirement that uh, taxpayers maintain uh, records of all of their uh, interest, uh, rather their contributions and uh, medical expenses and interest deduction. It eliminates that requirement. It makes it easy on the taxpayer to file a tax return. Get it back. 
Barton says you should keep good tax records because if you're audited, you'll have to substantiate all the deductions you've listed. If you make a mistake, you'll have to pay the tax plus interest, which has gone up to 20 percent. Borden says the local IRS office is offering assistance in filling out the forms, and the IRS will be setting up neighborhood self-help centers for those with questions. Some suggestions before mailing, use the address label on your form, include your W-2 forms, and be sure to sign your tax form. Gina Gregory, WSFA TV News. Program coordinator Jim Ziegler says for only $12 a year, residents in Elmore County can join the Citizens Crime Watch program. Various neighborhoods come together as a group and keep their eyes and ears open for would-be burglars and child molesters. Ziegler says each individual will receive a set of decals for windows, identification materials, the use of an electric engraving pen to mark personal items, and will be assigned their own personal identification number. In the Rural Protective uh, Identification System, we can give them numbers where they can put it on their equipment, the livestock, in the grain, in the hay, just anything, any property they got, they can identify it where we can identify it later if we find it, the equipment after it's been stolen. In places where people have identified the stuff, there's been a big drop in, in stolen merchandise, a big drop. We just can't get everybody to participate in it. The other portions of the Citizens Crime Watch program will be implemented in the near future. Interested persons should contact the Elmore County Sheriff's Office or the Wetumpka Police Department. Reporting from Wetumpka, Cassandra Taylor, WSFA TV News.
Well, I'm delighted that he resisted the efforts of those who would change his own beliefs about how to restore free enterprise uh, accompanied by compassion and to rebuild a reliable national defense. I also welcome his uh, efforts to return to the states and localities those functions which properly belong there. There are those which, uh, who would have had him uh, increase taxes and balance the budget on the backs of our working people. There are those who would have had him reduce defense spending during a time of dangerous imbalance. The president has stuck to his guns. I'm glad that he has. I think the people of Alabama are. And I would say in closing, as one who, of many who have served his country gladly, I appreciate the president's personal reference. The governor says it's a classic case of the system working the way it should, and he says he expects 95% of the commission's recommendations to be approved in both houses. The governor organized the 18-member crime commission last October to try to clean up what he calls soft spots in the law. After 60 days of hearings around the state, the commission is making what Chairman Judge Joseph Phelps calls some forthright and common-sense recommendations. They include, among other things, one-for-one -one jury strikes for prosecution and defense, changing the legal definition of an adult in a felony case from anyone 18 years old or older to anyone 16 years old or older. In general, a list of recommendations to make things easier for the prosecution and harder for the criminal. In all, 32 recommendations ranging from prisoner grievance committees to gambling laws. Members of the commission as well as witnesses from the hearings appeared before the Joint Legislative Judicial Committee after making their presentation to the governor to elaborate on the recommendations and push for approval. 
Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. And what we want to do this conference is to pull the cover back to see what we can do to get parents involved in educating their children, to see what we can do about assessing the whole bit of testing, to see, to talk about the issues facing black colleges, junior colleges as well, the mergers of junior colleges, the thread mergers of some junior colleges, the uh, mergers of the black institutions and so forth. So this is going to be an assembly of black leaders from across the state as well as white leaders to do what they can and, and, and then review what they possibly can on the future of black education in this state. That's done. You know, I don't know what the... Please come up. Yeah. Nobody knows. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's important. Mm -hmm. Where was it from? Until today, Judge Bonner has kept relatively quiet his comments about and the state's prison overcrowding, but he used right this occasion, honoring the state's federal judges, to air some of his concerns. First, he says as a federal judge, there are certain unpopular jobs that must be undertaken. He says legislators avoid discussion on ways to provide adequate housing for prisoners, so... Maybe I can make them sorry they didn't. Or maybe I can give them some reason to, to do it. But I can't order it. I'd be legislating. Judge of Honor says also deciding who's going to be freed places an unfair, terrible burden on the sheriffs and prison commissioner. He admits some of those considered to be released are undesirables. The habitual criminals who we know, if they go outside, they'll be back as soon as somebody catches them. But the judge says those inmates are off the list. And the judge says the public has an opportunity to communicate with the court about who's going to be freed. But Judge Fawner didn't talk about his second court-ordered mass release, which was halted by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals in Atlanta, and he didn't talk about the future of state prisoners. Kim Davis, WSFA, TV News. Newly appointed Pensions and Security Commissioner Faye Bacciano says the president's plan is good in theory, but she says it will work only if all of the federal red tape is removed. The concept is wonderful to give back to the states the right to make decisions that concern the people within those states. And who could better decide that than the legislature of Alabama, who deal with the people on a daily basis? If those programs are exchanged and if they're done equitably, if regulations are relaxed, but the thing that concerns us more than anything at this point is that regulations have never been relaxed before, that when programs have been turned over to the states, there's still so many strings on them. That Ms. Bagiano says if such a program were the initiated, the state of Alabama would Alabama. need an additional $258 million dollars to continue welfare programs at current levels. Another item on the agenda was the federal distribution of surplus cheese to individual states. PNS officials say Alabama will receive 1 million pounds of cheese valued at $3 million. The cheese will be distributed free of charge to 200,000 food staff recipients, with each family receiving a five-pound box. The cheese will be shipped next month to 30 different sites around the state and will be transported to the 67 counties by each county commission. Dan Black, WSFA-TV News. The Senate Finance and Taxation Committee approved an education budget of more than $1.4 billion. More than 18 amendments were considered, which moved money around so much that budget analysts say it'll take them a while to see what the final outcome will be. But some committee members say the budget now spends more money than is expected to be brought in. Over in the House Ways and Means Committee, the budget was kept in line, but members offered 27 amendments that ate away at any projected surpluses. 
The Ways and Means Committee also adopted a teacher's pay raise bill providing teachers, support personnel, and lunchroom workers with a 14% salary increase. But the House version of this pay raise bill puts local boards of education in the position of finding the money for increases mandated for lunchroom workers. The House committee held off on any action on a state employee's pay raise and general fund budgets until next week. Earlier in the day, the Senate Education Committee approved two controversial bills aimed at setting guidelines for textbook content and textbook committee membership. The controversy is not so much over the proposed need to strengthen textbook selections, but instead the means of finding the right type of restrictions. And the House Commerce, Transportation, and Utilities Committee postponed until tomorrow morning a vote on a Representative Gene Daniels bill that would restructure the Public Service Commission. Daniels' bill would increase PSC membership, establish a consumer advocacy group, and monitor it all with a legislative oversight committee. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News at the Capitol. I thought that uh, uh, President Reagan sounded extremely Jeffsonian. So I would say the president is sounding more like a good Democrat every day. Now, I do not think he went quite far enough on three or four uh, issues. I would have liked to have seen the president define precisely, precisely, what uh, the role of the federal government was. I wish the president had gone further and simply said, we are going to come down and over a period of two or three years, all of these uh, elements that the federal government has usurped over the last 20, 30, 40 years will be returned to the states on this basis. So I wish he had gone further, stronger, more decisive there. I wish he had talked to in greater detail would have been the cost of the federal government. Uh, they have not yet significantly reduced costs, contrary to I spoke with Luba Voschenko this morning, and she said that her mother and her oldest sister had gone back on liquids because that they were now aware of the response of the American people, and they have all along knew that, that the American people supported them. They don't trust the embassy, they don't trust the State Department, and because they have so many friends in the United States working for them, they've gone back on liquids. I'm very flattered by this trouble you've gone through to make a statement uh, written on a while it will be the next God of Alabama. I do not know about that, but uh, <laughs> but you're very kind. I want you to know that I appreciate your generous thought because the people of this state have truly been very kind, good to me. Not a one of you in this audience would want to go to Russia under a communist system where you could not say what you wanted to say. You had to have a work permit. You had to have a permit to go from Montgomery to Birmingham. You have to have per permission from the government to do everything. And the communist party says it is the party of the workers. When it is the workers in Poland that organize the Solidarity Union, that says they're not looking after the working people, they are against the working people. So my young friends, even though we see some difficult times, even in Montgomery, and I've seen so many people out of work, so many people cold and hungry, we're going to solve that some way. I'm not sure in which way we will do it, but it will be done. I think they're at a point, uh, Phil, where they're playing very well now. 
I think that's important. Sometimes you hit teams that are not playing as well as they perhaps should be playing, but that's not the case in Auburn's case. And uh, it'll be a very physical game. And if we do our part, it'll be a very good game. There'll probably be a lot of fouls. Do you think you have a few more fouls to spend inside than Auburn may have? Uh, maybe. I would say that's probably accurate. Um, I just hope that we're able to hit our free throws. We've done much better in that area. Both teams uh, seem to be shooting better at the line. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think Sonny will probably play a lot of zone, too. So um, I just don't know. Hope it's going to turn out. crowd tonight. What do you think about that? Well, I think that's, uh, that's great for Auburn. Um, you know, they brought the basketball program up some, I think, from last year, and people are excited about it. And I would hope that a lot of people are interested in seeing our team play and uh, as well as Auburn's improvement. So I think it's a combination of both. And, uh, we'll have to play extremely well in order to, to beat what I think is a good Auburn team, and I'm not saying that uh, uh, because we play tonight. I just I, I just feel they are, and uh, I think we're a good team. We played good at times and not so good at others, but I think you you look at that. Everybody in the league's been been doing that. I'm very flattered by this trouble you've gone through to make a statement uh, written on a Wallace will be the next God of Alabama. I do not know about that, but nobody's trying to go to Russia. Nobody's trying to go to the communist East Bloc to some of the controls of Russia. They don't want to go to communism. So I think that our system is proven to be the best by the fact that so many want to come here and nobody wants to leave here to go to any of these countries I'm talking about. Not a one of you in this audience would want to go to Russia under a communist system where you could not say what you wanted to say. You had to have a work permit. You had to have a permit to go from Montgomery to Birmingham. You have to have per permission from the government to do everything. of it. I, I'll, I'll see tonight how well I like it. I think, uh, you know, it would be better if we had a, a bigger, more comfortable place to play because there's so many people that want to see the ball game and not going to be able to see it, you know. But, uh, you know, it's uh, a good rivalry. It always has been. And I think uh, a lot of people would like it, but uh, from a financial standpoint, I'd like to play it someplace else. I would have liked to have seen the president define precisely, precisely, what uh, the role of the federal government was, such as a common defense for certain is one. And then the other, it would have been to have uh, elaborated on another prima facie responsibility of the federal government nobody likes to talk about, particularly those that have been part of it for a long time, is what is our role, uh, Bud, in giving us a stable currency that transcends the decades in value? Uh, so a man can work a lifetime and earn a retirement, and when he goes into retirement, he still has something. This is the city of Georgiana, population 2100, but there's only one doctor here. Dr. R.M. McCrew came to the city about nine months ago. 
Mayor Albert McGill says the hospital board agreed to pay all business costs for the doctor until he established his practice. The hospital board also paid for a doctor to come in to allow Dr. McCrew to have one weekend off a month. The hospital board feels Dr. McCrew has established a lucrative practice and it's time for him to pay his own way and not be subsidized by the hospital, which is reportedly running in the red. Dr. McGrew says he's agreed to take over the business expenses of running his private practice, but he wants the board to pay for doctors to fill in for him two weekends a month. He says it's not a question of money. Uh, not as much a financial thing as saying, hey, we appreciate what you're doing. Uh, we want to help you protect your health and, and keep you going. We realize that one person can only work so many hours. There's no question and about Dr. McGrew's performance. Residents say he's been a good doctor. He's brought more business to the hospital, and he says he wants to stay. Some residents have taken up his side of the issue and are protesting the board's position. What's at issue is the weekends off. Dr. McCrew says that was part of the incentives that brought him to the city. The hospital board says it was only a temporary measure, and it can't afford $1,000 a weekend to bring doctors in. But their agreements were made verbally. Both sides say it was a mistake, and next time, everything should be down in writing. Reporting from Georgiana, Don Phelps, WSFA TV News. A partial amortization is what the problem is. See the bar. Question comes to mind, do you, do you want to leave the, is it your desire? One of the important things to look at is the role that economic relations play. I think you will find that very often economic relations are the tail that wags the dog. Uh, no matter how uh, Gaddafi, for example, may rail against the United States, uh, he cannot afford to be terribly reckless in uh, his uh, anti-American activities because we're perhaps one of the best customers that, that uh, he has for his oil. And he needs, uh, he needs the dollars, he needs the hard currency that these, hard, hard, these uh, oil sales generate in order to, to, to stay afloat. The uh, common vernacular is free enterprise, and, and I believe we are very sound. A, uh, some things that the statistics but we all I think it's a, it's a fact that uh, 70 to 80 percent of all new jobs are created with companies of 100 or less employees uh, you'll see a growth in the service industries uh, tourism I hadn't mentioned I think you'll see Alabama uh, just uh, skyrocket in those areas that's already happening and uh, one thing to me right now is so critical. I think we've got pent up, command, uh, pent up demand across this country. Savings accounts are growing, uh, and that's good. Over the last several years, reference to Avalon and taxes. If you go back to 1970, funds are being used for the projects for which they were intended. That was the final 81 payment. Cedar funds will receive $4,790 two other major items there. We transferred from the district tax fund, which is a 3.5 mil ad valorem tax. Bring us up to date a little bit. Please, Deputy, at this time, I know he is very concerned about the bill, and I think he expects us to speak. Third, over the last several years, reference to ad valorem taxes. If you 
go back to 1976-77. I mentioned a good bit about that. Too. Yeah, Ms. Walker will mention this and we'll talk about some of the will be phased out completely. And then on the next two page, uh, next page, brother, you'll notice basic skills and youth conservation programs. 31-year-old Jimmy Sanford has been appointed to two other positions by the governor in the past three years and was named by James today to fill the vacancy on the Criminal Appeals Court. Previously, Sanford was appointed president of the Public Service Commission and was later named as the governor's legal advisor. In his announcement today, James said Sanford's appointment will allow him to pursue a role of judicial service to all Alabamians. When questioned about Sanford's experience, the governor said even though Sanford has never been a criminal lawyer, his knowledge of general law makes him well qualified to hold the office. His experience dealing with general law, which is encompassing those in uh, uh, close, close uh, uh, scrutiny and uh, relationship with a variety of legal documents that pass through this office, uh, his experience in Washington, be well qualified for the job, be it civil or criminal courts. Sanford's appointment to the five-member court will be effective February 12th. Matt Carmack, WSFA-TV News. Commissioners John Knight, Frank Bray, and Joel Barfoot voiced their concern over Stockman's failure to notify them about a meeting with financial consultants to discuss the new jail. That meeting was originally scheduled for Thursday the 14th, but because of bad weather, it was rescheduled for the following Tuesday. Commissioners Mac McWhorter and Bill Joseph were the only two commissioners who received advanced notification. Stockman says he tries very hard to inform all the members of any meeting. He says he left messages for Knight and Bray. Both say they didn't get the message. Knight says Stockman couldn't have left the message at his office because his office was closed. Bray says the only message he got was that the first schedule meeting had been canceled. Stockman says he couldn't get anyone at Barfoot's number. Barfoot was told when he called Stockman on the morning of the meeting. Knight and Barfoot say they came to the courthouse several times between Wednesday and Friday of that week. Knight says he saw Stockman on Wednesday and still wasn't told about the meeting. After discussing the issue for almost an hour, the commissioners approved Barfoot's motion for a public apology from Stockman, a letter of reprimand in his personal file, and an order placing Stockman on probation for five and a half months. At the end of that time, the commissioners will review Stockman's job performance. The commissioners also agreed to investigate the feasibility of a beeper system and a new telephone system for the courthouse. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA, TV News. The right policy is for us as a nation to consume less, to save more, to build more factories and less hula hoops, to get down to the serious business of making ourselves once again the strongest and most widely copied economic system in the world, the one that other people envy. We are losing that, my fellow Americans, and we're losing it fast. And I don't want to be here as a leader of American monetary policy making or as a leader anywhere in our country when we see one industry after another being outplayed on the field of economic combat by other nations simply because we don't know how to behave. They're having a little trouble with their recruiting drives and I think I see why after observing what goes on at your recruiting drives here. We've had a contradictions in the economy and in this announcement. We had a record of new investment capital, $4.2 billion last year. And total for new expanded industry announcement. The changing set of laws right now with the new tone that we have on the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and I believe that anyone that goes over there is going to have to put a good deal of diligent work into it. Uh, I'm prepared to do that, uh, and it's going to take some time, and it's going to take some diligent work, and I'm looking forward to the challenge of it.
staff members in their new adversary role and the attorney general's intervenors agreed the company did not prove it was suffering from a revenue deficiency. Both parties also found the company earned $515,000 more in their last rate increase case than allowed. But instead of ordering reduced rates, the commission told the company to use that money to upgrade inadequate telephone service in some areas of its operation. There were other factors involved which the commission considered. The fact that it granted to General Tell a $2.5 million increase two years ago, which is on appeal. Another factor involved the uncertainty of the telephone industry, which the company voiced major concerns in this case. A general Telephone Company has come in asking for some uh, rates based on a lot of things that may happen in the future with what's going on in Washington and with the uh, treatment of depreciation in a different way and the expensing of station connections and uh, various things of, of that nature which are accounted for a lot of the dollars in their asking. That hasn't happened yet. However, company official Gene Barrill feels the company did prove its case. The testimony and the witnesses who testified over the past several months in this rate case uh, plus evidence submitted by our company fully justified our request for increased rates. Barrill says GTE probably will appeal the commission's decision. Kim Davis, WSFA TV know. News. We'll have the order tomorrow afternoon and our next step. The fact that we were negotiating in at least four different languages, English, French, Farsi, Arabic, and uh, dealing with three different legal processes. And uh, the conduct of the negotiations was taking place in three different capitals, Tehran, Algiers, and Washington. It is to me miraculous under those circumstances that we were able to achieve what we achieved. A packed house looked on at Dunn Arena as the homestanding Hornets upended arch rival Tuskegee by nine. Melvin Armstrong was the hero of the night for Alabama State. Starting in the place of the injured Lewis Jackson, Armstrong responded with a career high 27 points, including 12 of Bama State's first 14. That enabled the Hornets to grab the early lead and never look back. Fred Freeman chipped in 25, most from long range, like this from the foul circle. Mike Freeney also had a great night for ASU. He dished out 11 assists, including this one to Elgin Bowman for the layup. Kenny Hayes paced the Golden Tigers with a game-high 28. That's him scoring the layup off the fast-break steal. Hayes also had 10 assists. Alabama State improves to 16-4 overall. They host Grambling at Dunn Arena Saturday night. Tuskegee now at 10 and 5 will visit Benedict College on Saturday. 
Rick Pons, WSFA TV Sports. The bill adopted by the Senate creates the Alabama Long-Term Nursing and Children's Care Commission. The bill's sponsor, Albert McDonald, says it's intended to expedite Medicaid reimbursements to nursing homes, high-risk nurseries, and pediatric care hospitals. The commission created by the bill would be a subdivision of the state Medicaid agency, but would be the sole authority in determining the method Medicaid reimbursements would be made to the specific Medicaid providers that were listed. However, it would reportedly cost the state an extra $100,000 a year to run this new administrative commission. The restrictions of budget isolation in transmitting that bill over to the House weren't any problem, except that it took a short while to gather the necessary 21 senators into the chamber to vote the bill out. Over in the House, the representative...